So if you wanted to go to an environment that looked like Mount Washington, but at sea level, you'd have to travel about 1,400 miles north into Arctic Canada. So it's really kind of an Arctic island in the sky surrounded by our temperate New Hampshire climate. It's really quite a unique place. And of course, geologists love this mountain. The rocks at the surface of the summit are upwards of 400 million years old. So geologists have been <coughs> pouring over this place for quite some time. And for those of us interested in the human history, of course, the first uh, person to set foot on the summit that we know of is an Irishman by the name of Darby Field, who came up there in 1642. So within one lifetime of many of our European ancestors coming to the New World, someone decided it was a good idea to come up to the top of Mount Washington, which is interesting. So this is what Mount Washington looks like, actually, as of last week. It was snow-capped, beautiful. We had 18 inches of snow in the last week alone, if you can believe that. It's been kind of a cool spring. It's been kind of an average spring, actually. Uh, the last couple of years have spoiled us in terms of it being pretty warm um, in springtime. But gosh, there was five and a half feet at the base of Tuckerman's Ravine as its base snowpack just three days ago. So there's going to be a lot of snow to melt in the next couple weeks, and they're expecting a pretty big warm-up early next week, possibly even pushing 75 degrees here by Tuesday, Wednesday, which is interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So this is that ravine I told you about. So Mount Washington on its <coughs> eastern side has two really uh, large ravines. They're technically called cirque ravines. Cirque ravines are carved by ice. They are U-shaped valleys, as opposed to our V-shaped valleys, which are more river valleys. But U-shaped valleys, like Tuckerman's Ravine, are really interesting, at least the ones in Mount Washington. They can hold their snowpack into uh, August, actually. So this uh, summer, if it remains kind of cool like this, we might expect snow into maybe late July and folks might be skiing until June and July in the ravine. And in fact, this is actually a, a picture from the Inferno race. It's a five-part race that happens in the ravine as part of it. I took this picture in 2014 on a really beautiful day. And you can see people uh, hiking up the side. And there's some folks here. And they're really trying to ski this area, the head wall. Mm -hmm. um, that can be quite treacherous. And part of the entertainment of watching these people is if they make it over this head wall, 90% uh, of them don't completely um, stay upright when they hit <laughs> the, the, the ground there, the snowpack. It's, it's quite incredible. And then there's uh, the Sherborne Trail, which starts at the kind of the base of the ravine, goes all the way down to Route 16 at Pinkham Notch. So it's really great backcountry skiing that, that will hold its snowpack for quite some time. And as you can tell, I mean, gosh, this is quite a vertical um, terrain. And it's, in fact, one of the only places in the East Coast that regularly avalanches. So we can get uh, really bad avalanches that are both natural and human triggered. And because of that, we have a, an avalanche forecasting center that's right kind of off of this image uh, a little below. It's the Mount Washington um, Avalanche Center. So we work the, with them closely. They take a lot of our data to uh, help uh, forecast for those avalanches. This is what the mountain looks like later in the late summer, early fall. Being from Maine, it kind of looks like a big blueberry barren to me. Lots of the plants that grow in Mount Washington are in the same family as the blueberry, <coughs> the Heath family. So they have that really beautiful crimson red color in the fall. And I also like this picture because you get to see what tree line looks like. So Mount Washington has the lowest tree line in the United States. Its tree line is at 4,500 feet, really low. And again, that's uh, kind of a uh, because of the extreme weather that we have. So our tree lines in most of the country are kind of shaped by the winds and the amount of ice that these places get. Out west, you can stand at six, 8,000 feet and then be in the middle of a forest. Uh, but on Mount Washington at 6,000 feet, you are in the middle of the alpine zone, completely exposed. So at Treeline, the trees that are growing don't quite look like trees. These are called krumholz, or German for twisted or crooked wood. They're 80 to 100-year-old trees that are growing maybe a foot off the ground in mass. 
and it makes for actually really difficult travel if you get stuck in them. They're actually affectionately known as spruce traps because they can really hold you in place. And you also see here rock piles. These are called cairns. They help us navigate our way through the Alpine Zone. Some of the oldest hiking trails in the United States are in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and folks have been creating and maintaining these rock piles to help navigate folks. On a day like this, it doesn't really seem that you really need the rock piles, but most of the year we are inside of a cloud, and it is hard to tell where you're going. So these rock piles help us out at least a little bit. In June, in just a few weeks, we're going to see the alpine bloom. So these, uh, the alpine zone of Mount Washington and its surrounding mountains, of course it's a treeless plain, but there are no plants. They're actually arctic plants. And arctic plants are very short-statured plants. They grow in, in basically little cushions. And in fact, the white flowering plant is called pincushion plant, also known as diapensia. And uh, they bloom briefly in early June. And alongside them, my favorite alpine plant is Lapland Rose Bay. It's in the rhododendron family. So the rhododendron's growing in your front yard. Imagine this one shrunken down to about one inch tall. So the flowers themselves are often larger than the entire plant body. Uh, and they do that, of course, to show off to the insects that are going to be pollinating them. So it's a really unique place to go in the, in the late spring, early summer, but bring that hand lens to really appreciate what they look like. So getting up to the summit, of course, the observatory, our weather observers, and most of the people that visit Mount Washington take the Mount Washington Otter Road, as some of us have. This is the oldest man-made attraction in the United States, built in 1861. Originally as a carriage road, it took about two and a half hours uh, for a carriage pulled by six horses to get up the auto road. Of course, back then before air conditioners, it was really nice to go up there in the summer and cool off. And that's what folks really did. Uh, but these days, of course, we take automobiles. As of around 1900, you started taking cars up the summit. And every couple years, uh, due to the intense history of <coughs> automobiles on this road, we close the road to a race to see how fast we can get up this automobile road. So it's a seven and a half mile road without any guardrails. How many uh, minutes do you think the, the fastest car it uh, took to get up to the summit? Five. Five minutes? That's a really good guess, actually. It is five minutes and 44 seconds as of July of last year, uh, or last summer, I should say. This, uh, it, it's quite intense. The gentleman drove a Subaru car that was modified to drive uphill at speeds up to 130 miles an hour. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, there's a YouTube video of him taken from GoPro cameras inside of the vehicle. So it's quite incredible. If you're sensitive stomach-wise, maybe you shouldn't watch it, but it is quite incredible. And uh, these mountain drivers are, are really talented, and it's fun to watch and be part of that history. Of course, on the other side, equally storied history, Mount Washington Cog Railway, a narrow gauge railway that go, comes up from Brenton Woods on the west side of Mount Washington, built in 1869. So both of these uh, incredibly storied history organizations often compete to see how many people they can dump on top of Mount Washington in the summertime. And uh, they do a good job. We see about 250,000 visitors between uh, Memorial Day and Labor Day. So, kind of bringing us up to speed here, Mount Washington Observatory, founded in 1932 specifically to study the atmosphere at and around Mount Washington to help us understand weather and climate using our little mountain as the focal point. And we uh, accomplished this mission through our daily, hourly weather observations, which we contract with National Weather Service out of Gray, Maine uh, to produce. So we give them our data. Our data helps to um, make forecasts for New England better. And then we also create a uh, twice daily forecast for that alpine zone environment. So we do get a lot of hikers that need to know what the weather is. In addition, I do educational programs just like this. I also go into schools, classrooms around New England. And we have a virtual program where we connect our weather observers to schools throughout the country and the world. So that's really unique to be able to compare and contrast your location with a weather observer on Mount Washington. Because chances are, 
their wind and their temperature is going to be a lot different from where you are down in the valley location. And then finally, research. So we've been at least partnering with organizations or doing our own research for as long as we've been around. So for 85 years, we were kind of, uh, we used to be kind of the place to study icing research back in the 40s and 50s. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So every hour of every day, you can expect someone to go outside and take a weather observation. And that really requires your eyes, uh, but it also, of course, requires your ability to interpret data and look at instruments and, and uh, then transmit that data through the internet. So that's really what we're doing. And it gets pretty cold in Mount Washington, as you can believe. Um, back in December, we had a, a daily record low set of 34 below zero, which isn't the <coughs> coldest, if you can imagine. Um, and of, of course, we had that fun with that. We took a boiling kettle and dumped it into the air, and it immediately froze, turned to, to frozen water, which uh, got us on the BBC News, and we got to dominate the headlines for a week, which was pretty fun. Um, and I say for a week because less than a week later, of course, we were at 36 below with a 90 mile an hour wind. And for just a couple hours, at least, we were tied for second uh, coldest reporting station on Earth. So we are really more like Ontar Northern Ontario, Russia, Northern Canada than we are like the rest of the United States, kind of neat. So more and more lately, and as possibly a consequence of climate change, we are getting some pretty intense rainfalls that happen in the middle of winter. So something that happened uh, in early mid-January, two inches of rain <coughs> fell on Mount Washington in a matter of 24 hours, and it turned our snow back from a deep January snowpack to one that you would absolutely expect in <coughs> late May, early June. So that was pretty wild. Of course, it just took a day or two to get back to that, um, but it, it, it's really interesting that this sort of thing can happen. <coughs> uh, again, later in February, we had 48 degrees, which doesn't sound very warm, but for us in the middle of winter, absolutely <coughs> tropical. Our record oldest is 47 below zero. So this is incredibly warm for us. Um, in mid-February, you can expect the average temperature to be somewhere in the negative teens to 20 below zero. So for 48, we got our observers, Tom and Taylor, out there with t-shirts. Of course, the wind was blowing at 100 miles an hour. And so it, it felt probably pretty cold on the skin. But, uh, but they had to get a photo of it. So as I mentioned, 27. Uh, average annual temperature, 47 degrees is the coldest, and the warmest ever in our 85-year recording history is 72, which is pretty incredible. So it's probably warmer in this room than it's ever been on the summit of Mount Washington. We use a lot of older technology that's non-digital to get a lot of our data. This is called a sling psychrometer. It's a handheld instrument that's consisting of two thermometers attached to each other. And we take it outside and swing it around. It gives us, well, air temperature, of course. Uh, but because one of those thermometers has a little wet sock on the end of it, it's also giving us atmospheric humidity, which is great. We don't need to plug anything in. Uh, it really has no batteries. It's just hand powered. It's really, it's really great. So we have some old technology. The second oldest mercury barometer in the United States is at Mount Washington, of course. The the oldest is at Blue Hill Observatory down in Milton, Massachusetts, near Boston. Uh, they are part of our history. They helped train our first observers. They gave us some instrumentation, including that barometer that I told you about. So we have a lot of old technology that we still use today to help us uh, get our important data. And uh, I like this picture because it, it segues into a short video that I want to play for you. Just in case anyone's thinking about falling asleep, this is one of the harder data to collect up there. This is, uh, this is precipitation. So this can sits out on Mount Washington Summit in the middle of our parking lot, um, very exposed to collect any kind of rain or snow that's fallen. And every six hours, as mandated by National Weather Service, we have to go outside and collect that data. Uh, collecting that data is easy enough said, but I'll show you what it's like on a not so great evening to collect that uh, data for you. Bye-bye. 
device. And when it's this cold like it is, it doesn't take much to actually knock it off. Anytime winds are high like this, you don't really want to spend a lot of time oh, messing around up there. You basically want to get up there, smack what you need to get off, and then just get down as quickly as possible. The faster you can get it done, the less strain it is on your body, the more reassuring that you're going to get in the, safely. That's not the part that I want to see. Anyway, so that's good. All right, heading out to get the preset can. Uh, a lot of people often ask me what the most scariest part of my job is, and this is probably one of them. Uh, the main reason being because I have to fight the elements and everybody's asleep at night, so I really don't have anybody waiting for me if I don't make it back. Now, if winds were high, I more than likely wake somebody up to be waiting by the door. But on a night like tonight, where winds are blowing about 90 miles per hour and only gusting to 100, Albeit it's strong, but it's not too, too dangerous for myself. I've been out in these plenty of times. Now, right now, we have a westerly <coughs> wind, so we're kind of in the lee of the building, so it's not too, too bad. But once we get to the end here, we'll feel the full full brunt of the winds and slowly make our way out to the precip pan, which is in the center of the summit here. And around this corner, this is usually where it's <laughs> can create whiteout conditions at times, making it really difficult just to see the hand in front of your face. Right. Okay, so what do you think? <laughs> Does he have to milk the cows? <laughs> I, I'm, frankly, I'm surprised at the lack of safety precautions that there to and he's out in the middle of the night by himself. Yep. He talked about he said doesn't have crampons on. He talked about not seeing in front of his face the probability of walking into a dangerous area very yeah. high. Yep. If he goes missing, who's gonna know that I, I'm just so surprised, Will, as as regulated as the yeah. observatory is that this just doesn't seem to be in place. Yeah, that's absolutely a great point. So if he was uncomfortable in the situation, he would wake other people up. He Absolutely. did say that, yeah, yeah. He did. And in certain situations that for him, for the average person, this looks quite dangerous. For mm -hmm. someone like Ryan, he's been on the mountain for a, more than a decade. And his personal highest wind is 156. So <laughs> 90 miles an hour for him is yeah. no sweat. Yeah. But for many of the observers, it's not like that. And they will be wearing uh, traction on their feet, absolutely. Crampons or microspikes yes. at least. They will not be tethering in. That is something, a question we get all the time. Yeah. Do you use ropes? Unfortunately, that would be much more dangerous. If we had a roping system, if that was to break or if we were to fall and get tangled, our lives would be at stake very quickly. So, every single observer has their own threshold. If it's high, too high for someone like Ryan, we'll call something into the National Weather Service along the lines of, we can't go out, it's way too bad. 
Um, but as I said, otherwise, we'll wake others up and we'll go outside with them. And we'll all be watching. And you notice that, well, he wasn't alone. He had a videographer with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in this particular instance, we had a videographer embedded with the staff for about a week and a half back in 2014 to gather footage for a new museum exhibits that have since been installed up on Mount Washington. So we do have a, some really great footage that he was able to get. You saw one of those points where it cut, where the video went sideways. Well, he fell, the, uh, the videographer did fall, and um, he took a bit of a bump on his bum. But, uh, but he was able to get back up, and they were able to redo the take that night. So yeah, so that's a great point, absolutely. But we take our safety incredibly uh, seriously up there. So for all of that, we are seeing an average of 26 feet of snow in the, the winter time. So we get about 100 uh, inches of liquid equivalent. That's melted snow plus rainfall every uh, year. So it's about twice as much rain and snow as you would see in the valleys around us. And that's uh, due to something called orographic lift. So that is really the, the uh, vertical motion of air that is uh, taking place as um, air moves over a mountain peak. So as air moves up and over a mountain peak, that air is brought into lower atmospheric pressure, which necessarily expands it, cools it, and makes any kind of uh, moisture in that air precipitate out. In, at least to begin as cloud, and then if it continues um, in that uh, motion, it'll, it'll become rain or snow. So we are a very wet, cloudy place. Mountains are generally. Um, and Mount Washington, even though it's small, is not an exception. The most snow we ever got was 47 feet in the winter of 1969. For those of us who can remember, I certainly cannot. But uh, what I was told is that the ravines never melted out that summer after this heavy snowfall, so, so that's interesting. Using our eyes, we take some other data. We look out to see how far we can see. We can see the tallest mountains in upstate New York on the clearest of days. That's 130 miles to our west. Uh, some days we can see the Atlantic Ocean outside of Portland, Maine. It uh, appears as a orange line on the horizon, quite stunning. Um, and we use that as a, a marker that's about 70 miles to our southeast, uh, which is Maine. So that's Portland, Maine, the peninsula right there. But this is what we see most of the year. <laughs> Pea soup fog, 60% of the time we're inside of a cloud. And so that makes observations, well, easier in a way, but also a little bit more boring. And our weather observers can often go weeks without seeing the sun. Um, but they work up there a week on and week off, so they get to see the sun when they're in the valley. This is something that also happens. When you take that heavy fog and you add it to sub-freezing temperatures, you get frozen fog, also called rime ice. This is a phenomenon of the Arctic uh, and high mountain uh, zones, especially mountains that are near the coast with uh, ample moisture, you can get a lot of rime built up. So this is about five feet of rime ice growing on our summit side. What's neat about this structure, well, it's incredibly brittle, um, and it's great to take pictures of. It grows into the direction of the prevailing wind. So if you look at it, you can see, uh, basically, it's flagging in the direction of the wind uh, is coming from. So most of our rime ice does grow kind of to the, to the west-northwest, because our winds come from the west-northwest. Not all the time. But that's the prevailing wind direction. Another one of our night ops, uh, or I should say our night tasks, is de-icing. And that is when someone goes outside the very top of our instrument tower with a crowbar or a mallet and manually removes the rime ice off of our instrument casing. So we're not hitting the instruments themselves, but we're hitting a structure that they're all attached to. And it sends a vibration up into the instruments which releases the ice. So sometimes we have to do that 10 times an hour during the heaviest icing events in winter time. It's often a task we give to the interns. <laughs> so rime ice can hit us every month out of the year. We get measurable snowfall in all months out of the year. And this I took in June of two years ago. So um, 
they couldn't do any work in the morning when all of their ins uh, their instrumentation and their uh, uh, their vehicles were covered in ice. Of course, this is Cog Railway working on their tracks. Uh, but, so we can get sub freezing temperatures all year long, and that's part of why Mount Washington is such a dangerous place. You can get up in the morning in Boston, it's 80 degrees, and you can travel to the top of Mount Washington in less than half a day and be inside of a blizzard. So that's part of why we're up there taking these <coughs> observations for public safety. So one of our unique <laughs> instruments, this is called the pedostatic anemometer. We use this to gather wind speed data. We invented this back in the 1940s with help from General Electric Corporation. The pedo part of that comes from this tube here. Pedo tubes are often found on aircraft and they tell the pilot how fast the plane is going. So we attach it to a wind vane and put it on a post and wrap it up in heat tape. There's also small heaters inside the instrument and it keeps it for the most part ice free. And it gives us our important wind data. Our winds are the strongest winds that, <laughs> that are regularly hitting any place in the world. We have the highest average wind speed of any reporting station in the continental United States, 35 miles an hour, which in the valley, if you get a 35 mile an hour wind, you feel it. Um, but on Mount Washington, we get hurricane force winds every two days in winter time. That's 74 miles an hour and up. Uh, every four days we get winds of 100 miles an hour or greater. So as I mentioned, Ryan was out there in 90 to 100. That's literally every three days in wintertime. Very average. But our highest wind, we actually celebrated the big wind day back on April 12. Of 1934, we recorded 231 as our peak wind for that day, which was at the time a world record. 1996, the higher wind speed was reported on Barrow Island off of Western Australia. That was 253, and that was in association with a cyclone, what we call hurricane. Uh, so unfortunately, highest wind ever was taken away from us, but we still remain the highest wind directly observed by mankind. Because we had observers in a small observatory, not our current one, but a small observatory about a quarter of the size of this room. And they were in there, um, and they use a, a different device than what we currently use for our anemometer wind speed device. Uh, but they still got that, and it was verified by the World Meteorological Organization. So that was really neat. And uh, you'll know when you go up to the top of Mount Washington how windy it is. So this is uh, kind of an averaging out of all the low pressures that might come across the United States. Notice how they all terminate in New England. We are affectionately called the tailpipe of the United States because we get the rest of the country's air. And a storm, of course, uh, a storm can go right over us or it can move to our north or to our south. Hurricane Sandy, well, Superstorm Sandy, when she made landfall, made landfall 400 miles south of Mount Washington. But Mount Washington recorded the highest wind speed of that landfalling storm, which was 140 miles an hour. So we can feel storms effects from far away. So we're kind of sitting at the bullseye there of what we would say is three major storm tracks. Those storms that come in from Pacific Northwest, Ohio River Valley, and up the Atlantic seaboard. So we can get quite a lot. To capture winds on a daily basis, we use a small paper chart called the Hayes wind chart. This traces 24 hours of wind and it's changed out at midnight by the night observer like Ryan who I showed you in the video and the way you read it is that the center closer to the center this red line goes the lower the winds and the closer it goes to the uh, edge of the circle the higher the winds so on a day like this February 16 2015 that day will live in infamy because um, unfortunately a woman perished on Mount Adams between Mount Adams and Mount, Mount Madison in the northern presidential range. Uh, she lost her life on that day. She didn't check the weather that morning when she went up. And the average temperature for the last two days was 35 below zero. The wind hit 140 down around 6 a.m. So it was six hours of 120 mile an hour winds. She was planning on making a presidential range traverse, which is going from the northern presidentials all the way across to Mount Washington. And I see that Ty Gagne book in your hands. That's uh, an interesting book if you want to learn about 
the mistakes that this woman made um, leading up to her loss of life. It's, it's a cautionary tale, and anyone who's interested in mountaineering um, and safety in the mountains should definitely read that book. Uh, we're mentioned quite a bit in it because it was one of those times where the night observer who's making the forecast literally said, if you go out, we may not be able to rescue you because the conditions are so dangerous. Um, but really, again, that's why we're up there. We create twice daily forecasts in both a narrative form so you can read what's going on and in a bullet form so you can just see what's the high and low temperature, what's the wind speed expected for the next day to two days. So the information's out there and you can't plead ignorance when you go up into the mountains. You really need to be prepared, especially above tree line, because the weather can change just like that. We get up and down with snowcat in the winter time. This rides up onto the snow, so we're driving up the auto road, but the auto road might physically be 30 to 40 feet below us, because as the winter progresses, we are plowing the snow and making a flat road. So as the snow falls and drifts onto the road, we plow those 45, sometimes 90 degree angle slopes into a flat surface. So by spring, so right now, auto road is cutting the snow off of the road. And as they're going up and up and up, preparing for an opening around Memorial Day weekend, you get to some really incredible snow drifts where they've cut down 70, 80 feet, 100 feet, and the road's there, but the top of the snow is up here. And that's one of the fun uh, pictures we take every spring is the observers lined up with a huge snow drift above them. So uh, it's about a, well, eight, eight miles an hour on an eight mile road. You can do the math. It takes us quite a while to get up to the top. And on some really nasty days, it might take six hours to go up uh, the road. Um, and that's really down to visibility. Um, so we're crawling along during some of those days. Instruments testing on Mount Washington goes back quite a ways. Uh, just a few years ago, we had Boston Dynamics bring up some of their rovers. We were testing the effects of the lower atmospheric pressure on their engines. So at 6,288 feet, you are at 20% less atmosphere, so you're breathing about 20% less oxygen. So what that means is really not a whole lot for you and I. You might feel a little winded when you're walking up and down the staircases up there. Um, I have trouble sleeping up there, and I think it's probably because of the lower atmosphere. But it's important for testing purposes. If you are a local company, but you want to send a product out west to a higher elevation, it might be nice to test your objects up on that wall. And things like tents, clothing, we've done all that. And I mentioned this earlier, so this is from a local paper out of Washington back in the 1950s. Basically, Mount Washington was the place to go if you wanted to test your jet engine components on Mount, uh, basically in icy conditions, you could send them to Mount Washington. So we were partnered with the Air Force back then uh, to create a unique place for pretty much constant, at least in wintertime, icing. Other things you wouldn't think of. So Keurig, the um, Green Mountain Coffee Company owned uh, uh, brand, they brought up a bunch of their little cake cup machines and um, who knew these little cake cups blew up at 6,000 feet. So <laughs> they had to adjust the pressure to, uh, to match the, the lower atmospheric pressure before they could send them out to Denver and places like that. So that was fun to be part of their story. <laughs> and of course, clothing oh. testing. Now, this is uh, Mount Washington's pet cat, uh, Mount Washington Observatory's pet cat, Marty. And this is, as far as I know, the one time he wore his custom <laughs> jacket. Uh, Eastern Mountain Sports is our clothing sponsors. They give us um, clothing to stay warm and comfortable. And cats have always been a part of Mount Washington's story. We've had cats going back to our founding. They took care of the mice that back then got into our food from time to time. So it was important for us to have animals uh, like cats to take care of that. Nowadays, they keep our Night Observer Company, and they're a great mascot for the organization. They're really, uh, you know, they, they're an animal that are versatile. They love being up there. This one's been up there 11 years. So he's getting a little old. He came up during um, the, actually, the election of 2008. We had a cat election. Three <laughs> cats were chosen from the local Humane Society, and Marty was like the charismatic one because he probably meowed 
the once in the video or something. <laughs> but Marty, Marty's great, so he's been up there and he keeps us company. Um, so we'll see if uh, it might be time to get a, a new cat in the near future, well, who knows. So for all the high winds that we go out in, this is something we will not uh, go outside in, absolutely not. This is a red line for us. Lightning is uh, very dangerous. So being inside of a thunderstorm on a 6,000 foot mountain, anywhere outside is potentially bad news. So we will be inside for that, but maybe trying to get a few pictures if we can, which is pretty neat. In May of 2012, right after I started working for the observatory, I was up there in a thunderstorm one day, and it was wild. Uh, the brightest kind of a blue-white light that flashes, and then immediately there's thunder. And it's a strange sound when you're inside of it. I guess, I guess in an airplane you could hear it too, although I, I hope to God I never get to be inside an airplane for a thunderstorm, but, uh, but when it is simultaneous, it, uh, it's like a tin, almost like a tin drum sound, steel pan drum, I should say, really a unique sound um, that I'll never forget. So that's something that is very interesting. We are weather nerds, so we do like cloud types. This is called a hole punch cloud. We see these often around airports where a plane might physically punch a hole through a cloud layer. Uh, we also get lenticular clouds. These form all over the world where there are mountains, um, where there are mountains and sufficient moisture to form clouds around them. So high winds, as they go up and over, will basically form, uh, if there's any moisture kind of pockets, will transform that moisture into a oval or, or you know, circular cloud. And they sit for hours at a time in the same place. They don't move. So they look a lot like UFOs or flying saucers. Really spectacular cloud type. <coughs> this is called a Brock inspector. This is what the shadow looks like if you are standing between a cloud and the sun, which often doesn't happen for us in the valley. But if you're in a plane, that can happen if you're looking out at a cloud deck. But it can also happen up in the mountains. So that's really unique. Um, that's an elongated or enlarged shadow with a series of rainbows around it, which is pretty awesome to see. We also get an undercast from time to time where the mountains physically stick up above the clouds. Uh, that can happen whenever there's a strong inversion, so there's not a lot of mixing going on. High pressure will kind of cap clouds at the surface. Maybe they come in off the Atlantic or something. Um, that could be spectacular. Aurora Borealis, if we're outside of the clouds and if the sun's feeling like it, we might get um, a solar storm which can result in, um, in a, an aurora. So that's pretty neat. And then my last uh, photo here, this is one of my favorite hikes about two miles off the summit cone down to um, a series of glacier lakes called Lakes of the Clouds uh, at about 5,000 uh, plus elevation right next to the Lakes of the Clouds Alpine Hut run by Appalachian Mountain Club. So that's one of my favorite hikes and a great view back to Washington if you ever get a chance to check it out. Uh, I want to share with you one short video uh, to get us in the mood to ask some questions and then we'll take any questions you might have. So this video we got two years ago. Um, oh, actually it's... Yeah. 16. <laughs> 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 That wind. So this was right around a hundred sustained. <laughs> All right, so with that I'll take any questions you might have about our life up on Mount Washington. Any of you inspired to go visit us in the summer, perhaps? <laughs> I should say we do offer overnight and day trips in wintertime via our snowcat. Um, and those are really unique programs to take you 
up into the outline zone, into the observatory, get a behind the scenes tour, visit our um, observers and our living quarters, of course, and our new museum, walk around the summit a little bit. It's basically from about nine in the morning to two in the afternoon. Quite a, a quick trip. And our overnight trips are similar, but they have an educational theme and offer um, very unique lessons on a particular topic, such as alpine photography, meteorology, uh, climatology, geology, things like that, that are related to our mission. So those happen only in winter. This summer, we are offering four overnight trips that'll start in the afternoon and go to the following midday-ish. So those are on our website, mountwashington.org, and they're featuring kind of the life and work of the observers on two of them, and thunderstorm science on the other two. So we're hoping we get a thunderstorm during that program, but we'll, we'll see. We can't predict that far in advance. Yes? Curious, when you go up in the snow cap, you say sometimes it's a six hour journey, extreme weather conditions. What safety precautions if the snow cat breaks mm -hmm. down? Yeah, so what we would do is we would just be in place. We would essentially shelter in place. It would be more dangerous, depending on where we are on the road, if we're above tree line, to get outside and try to make it up to the summit. It's really all down to visibility. If the visibility is there, it's actually a lot easier with your goggles outside of the cap to see where you are than inside because often we create our own ground blizzard as we're driving up the road so sometimes an observer will help even guide a snow cat up by walking ahead of it because they can see the road much better than the snow cat can sometimes even you're melting the snow off of the uh, windshield and then it's refreezing and it actually makes the visibility a little worse so sometimes an observer is needed that's only really going to be happening selectively and it's only going to be happening with our staff or we're going up and guiding and that sort of thing um, other measures if it's incredibly bad will often go in tandem with the mount washington state park so mount washington state park owns the physical summit about 60 acres they are our landlords so we have a mutual interest in getting safely up to the top on wednesdays when we go up together um we'll go you know it'll be one snowcat behind the other and we'll help take turns plowing up and down the road so if it's bad we'll go together if it's incredibly bad we'll just postpone the trip and go another day and so part of what we've done in the last couple of years is built into every one of our overnight or day trips we have a backup date just in case the weather gets hairy yeah what are they used to heat the observatory yeah so we have kerosene uh, generators that kind of kick in if our electricity goes down we're actually on um, electric power uh, it's buried cable along the cog railway tracks coming out of uh, Brentwoods the hotel um, <coughs> in Brentwoods the Omni so we have um, electric and then our water is actually a dug well about 600 foot dug well on the top down into apparently the same level of water that those lakes are at um, down below and um, every month we'll take we'll get a bulk food order so uh, every time every Wednesday shift change day we'll take up fresh groceries for the week um, but we have enough storage capacity and enough food to last us about three months if we need it and I say that because there was actually a, a New Hampshire Public Radio story on surviving the zombie apocalypse, and they found that Mount Washington, theoretically, hypothetically, would be the best location in New Hampshire to do so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? How large is the staff? Up here? Sure, so uh, the nonprofit's about 25 people, and um, I'd say about a third of that staff are summit staff. So maybe about seven, eight people are summit staff. On each shift, there's three observers, usually two interns that are maybe taking part in a four-year degree related to meteorology or climatology. And then two other people who are civilians, members of the public, who as part of membership to the observatory are given the opportunity to visit the summit with the observers for a week in winter and summer. And their one task is to cook dinner for the observers during the week and it's it's fun it's uh it's one of those opportunities we get some of the same folks coming back 
year after year for a decade or more that take care of the observers. It's really quite nice and it's a unique perk of our uh, member uh, supported organization. Yeah. If we were taking the COG railway up, is there a forecast that you could give like early that day as to what the weather might be mm -hmm. that day? Yeah. So you could go on the website or what? Yeah, it's all on mountwashington.org, and we yep. spell Mount, M-O-U-N-T, Washington.org. And it's on our, uh, let's see, it's on our current summit conditions and higher summits forecast page. Mm -hmm. So you can see what the weather's doing right now, and then you can also see what it's expected to be doing in the next 24 to 48 hours. How, how um, would you rate a day, you know, um, the clouds and everything, how clear it's going to be? Yeah, yeah, we will. And we have unique language that actually specifically <coughs> is for the alpine zone because we're often above clouds. Yeah. So we can say we're in the clear under mostly cloudy skies, which means that the summit itself is clear, but if you look up, there's another cloud bank above us. Mm -hmm. So we actually, in that forecast language, will mention what the clouds are doing right around the summit and then above the summit, which is pretty unique because we can get summit fog, as I mentioned, most of the year. But then we can get clouds above that uh, mm -hmm. uh, layer. So our forecast language is specific for Mount Washington, right. and that's daily. You can Good. check that out. It's in the morning, so we upload it around 5 a.m. and then again in the afternoon, 2 or 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Yeah, and I actually have a, a number of brochures that I'll, I'll give out if you if you like them. Um, but you've been a great audience. I'll stick around for any other questions. But for those of you who want to head out, feel free. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.